Welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm your host, Bruce Waller, where I get to talk to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace and in our community. What did they do to get started and what do they do to stay there to accelerate in that leadership lane? And I have a special guest today. Her name is Nicole DiRocco. She is a global human resources executive and thought leader. And I am so excited to have you on the show. Hey, Nicole. Hey there. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And you know, I was actually reflecting on the first time I met you. I think it was at a Dallas HR networking event. Uh, I don't remember exactly when that was, but here's what I do remember. We were later reconnected with our good friend, Mike Karakalis. You remember that? Yes. yes, I do. Yes, he did. Yes. He is a, he's a great connector for sure. And um, I actually was excited to have that uh, reintroduction to you because then I had your undivided attention because I suspect if we were at a Dallas HR event, you were everywhere. <laughs> oh my gosh, I am so excited to like get into this today. We're going to talk leadership, we're going to talk executive coaching, and a whole lot more. I want to start though, I want to start by uh, you sharing the Nicole DiRocco story, like where did you grow up and how in the world did you get into leadership, in particular with HR and executive coaching? Yeah, uh, well, so I I'm a Texan by default. Uh, was raised and schooled in part abroad. I went to high school in Seoul, Korea for four years. I lived and worked in uh, Germany and in Hong Kong post-university. So embracing change and being adaptable has served me well in my chosen field of, of HR. Um, and it also deepened my um, appreciation and understanding and, and uh, compassion for diverse people and cultures. So I feel very fortunate uh, for that perspective of the world around me. But I really thought it would be glamorous to be an attache to some ambassador somewhere. So I was going to sit for the foreign service exam at the US consulate in Munich where my father was working at the time. And I had graduated from university and on my parents' invitation, had gone to live with them to do some more traveling and registered to take the exam in October. It's given in October of every year. My mother was very sick. She passed away in September of that year. And we came back to the state suddenly. And here I am with this very unmarketable liberal arts degree. And I don't wanna to go to law school and I don't wanna teach. And I came upon this organization that had a very robust college management training program. And they were open to putting me on the HR track. So that's how I fell literally into HR. <laughs> oh my goodness. Talk about global experience. I did not even realize Seoul, Korea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, when people, you know, they talk about they fall into HR or they fall into whatever uh, role they're in, it, it seems like they all have, you know, once they get to a certain point, they kind of look back, right? And they think, okay, I fell into it. I love it. And that's why I stayed in it, right? So, you know, I always like to ask, like, was there a moment like when you, like when you found your lane, of course, I like to reference, find your lane, your purpose uh, in, in your career, was there a time for that? Or were there like moments? Yeah. I would say, I would say the latter, you know, what I finished that management trainee program and I immediately was thrown into, to being a field HR manager in this, in this organization. And it was a lot of responsibility for somebody, you know, I'm in my early twenties at that point. I don't really have a lot of, I have no really corporate working experience and I'm at a multi-site, multi-state unionized location. I have people reporting into me. I was not a leader, I was a people manager. I didn't mm. have the experience at that point to have the perspective of what a leader is. And it really was, um, you know, several years later when I was with a different company and I had been tapped to go to Center for Creative Leadership, CCL, which mm -hmm. for those of you who know CCL, it is top shelf in organizational development. It is a global organization. It is high end, high touch intense leadership development. And so I went uh, into this uh, program and there were um, uh, people on my team in this particular cohort and we had a, a lifeboat simulation. And this is really where I gained awareness that perhaps I've been dipping my toe in the leadership pond all along and I didn't know it. 
But essentially what it was, the, the lifeboat simulation was about getting the lifeboat to safety. And each person on the lifeboat had a particular role to play and had been given instructions. I had been voted by the team to be the leader. I was not given instructions. And by the way, this was all being videotaped too for, for feedback to us. And so this group, they were creating chaos. They were yelling, they were screaming, they were creating confusion. They were pointing fingers at each other. There weren't enough life vests for everybody. And so because I had no instruction, I just did what I do naturally. And I remained calm and mm. collected. I, um, I allayed fears. I listened to people. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I got everybody to safety. But we did it. We did it together. And what I realized, I'm like, well, this is who I am at my core. Because as, for as long as I can remember, I have been the go-to person for balanced perspective and insight, whether that's with my siblings, with friends, with colleagues. So that was really, you know, a bit of a, an awakening, so to speak, that hmm, I think I do embody some of the traits of a leader. I love, I love how you said balanced perspective. Now, I I'm curious, uh, you know, here you are, you, you know, they're picking you as being a leader. Did you ever like figure out like why why were they picking you? I mean, it, it's you know you get in these and we've all been there, right? We get around the table, and you know there's I remember being in a Dallas HR event. There's five people around the table, and they say, okay, pick whoever's going to take you know be the leader of the table, and all the fingers point to that one person. Uh -huh. What is it do you think that people people saw in you, or that typically you see when you in those situations? Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it is, you know, uh, acting with courage and conviction. So, mm. you know, being able to, to, to say what's on your mind. Um, but I also sense, and I know this about me, um, my demeanor, it is a, you know, there's, um, I, I don't get my feathers easily ruffled. Just, I never have been that person and I am calm and collected in the face of adversity. So, you know, it's, it really has served me well in, in human resources when we are faced with, you know, ambiguous situations all of the time. Well, I know that uh, one of the things I always talk about, you know, leadership is really equivalent to being a great coach, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I noticed also about your LinkedIn profile. So that's one of the things I really enjoy is whenever I'm having a guest on, I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the LinkedIn profile, I'm checking it out. What are people saying about Nicole? And so many good things, so many good things, but so many good things around like coaching mm -hmm. and thought leadership. And there are, you know, I saw transformation and I was just wondering, like, how has your professional coaching, like training, like, how's that made you a better HR leader? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I had uh, several years ago, I come to a crossroads in my life and it was, what is my purpose in life? What am I supposed to be doing? And mm. I had the light bulb moment. My purpose is to be of service to others. And mm. I've always been interested in coaching because coaching is about helping people realize their full potential. So when I went back into the master's program in organizational behavior and coaching and became professionally trained as an executive and professional coach, and then ultimately I sat for the ICF or International Coaching Federation credential which I hold today, um, I was one of three uh, HR executives in my cohort of 42 people. And it was the HR executives who had the most difficulty with this coach training program. And do you know why? Tell because me. Because we are the experts. We are accustomed to telling people what to do. And that is not what coaching is. Mm. Coaching is about facilitating the self-discovery process. Mm. It is about asking powerful questions. It's about staying curious. It's about evoking awareness. And so for me, what it has done, it has really challenged me to grow as an individual, to ask the right questions. And it has made me, it has deepened my ability to co-create solutions with business leaders as a thought partner. So I highly recommend for all my HR brothers and sisters out there that they, 
make the investment of a formal coach training program because one of the things that I, I also know to be true coming out of a corporate setting is that the word coach is a misnomer in corporations. It is misapplied. In, it is used as uh, in a punitive way. That person needs to be coached up, mm. you know, which is code for get them straight, right? That's not coaching. And, and so it really, it really is about um, being curious. And, and this is really what I have learned, Bruce, is uh, there's, I follow the work of Michael Bungay Stainer, uh, who has written The Coaching Habit and The Advice Trap. And his mantra is, can you just stay curious just a little bit longer? Mm. Because so many good things happen when we can just be curious just a little bit longer rather than giving advice and telling someone what to do. I absolutely love that. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, some different executives when they talk about, you know, what's one trait that, you know, would be great to have. And curiosity seems to be a very common trait. I love that. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but Darren Hardy, I listened to some of his coaching videos and he was just talking recently about one of the things that's helped him throughout his career is the uh, trait of being curious. And whenever he's interviewing different leaders and he notices that about leaders, when they're really curious, they just seem to like drive conversations just to a different place. I, I want to ask you, what does curiosity bring and, and what can it open up for people? Yeah. Uh, so many, so many good things. It is, um, you know, it, I, I mentioned Michael Bungay Stanger earlier, and and he talks about you know curiosity being you know like a superpower because hmm. not only does it help drive business success because you get to you know spend time figuring out what it is you need to be focused on, but it's also a way of increasing humanity in an organization, and you want to be in an organization where people are flourishing. And so often the default of an organization is not to allow people to, to flourish. And so curiosity is a way of bringing forward the very best in people to uh, where you're allowing them to be themselves. So if you're in an organization and you're focused on two things, one culture where people are engaged and flourishing and two focus where you're really spending time on the things that matter then you have a greater chance of having a company that's going to be successful. So that's what it opens up. I absolutely love that. And, and let me just say this real quick. If you are listening to the podcast right now or you're watching, get your pen out, get your journal out, take some notes. There is absolute gold here. I just absolutely love that. I love that. Hey, um, tell me about, I know we were discussing this before, but tell me about the advice giving monster. Can you share that? Um, yeah, absolutely. And again, this is from Michael Bungay uh, Stanger's work, uh, but the advice giving monster is within all of us. Each of us has the advice giving monster. The advice giving monster is that insatiable thing that fuels us to the need to, to give advice and answers when mm. curiosity and good questions are way more powerful. And there are three ways that giving advice can go off the rails. Mm. And, and, and so I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying never give advice okay. because, you know, there are times where, you know, giving advice is, is appropriate because that's really the way we work. It's, it's reactive advice giving. So can you slow down the rush mm. to action and giving advice? So the first way that advice giving goes off the rails is that, you may not be focused on the right problem. Hmm. I don't know about you, but in my career, nine times out of 10, the person that comes in my office, they're not talking about the problem. They're talking about the symptom. They're hmm. talking about the first thing that came to their mind. So it's, you may, might not be focused on the right problem. So it's worth staying curious just a little bit longer. The second way that it goes uh, awry, Bruce, is that your advice is not as good as you think it is. I'm sorry to say, but there are so many cognitive biases wired into making you think that you're a better driver than you are, that you're a better advice giver than you are. 
And the reality is your advice, my advice, it's slanted, it's biased, it's prejudiced, it's based on the first thing you said, based on the last thing you did, based on your own history. So it's really worth thinking, maybe my advice isn't as powerful and helpful as I had hoped it could be. And the third thing you know, that, that allows or, or gives advice uh, giving to go off the rails is really the most powerful and it's the impact of the, to the other person. Because even if you do know what the problem is and even if you do know what the right answer is, the right leadership question to ask yourself, what is the right leadership act at this mm -hmm. moment for this person? Is it to give them advice and have them be on their way? It might be, but more often than you realize, the right leadership act is to hold the space so that that person can figure out the problem and come up with a solution himself or herself. And that is where empowerment happens. So when you're empowering somebody to come up with the, the solution and figure out the problem, you are creating the space to increase that person's competence, their confidence, their self-sufficiency, their autonomy. And those are things that we all want, not just in an organization, but we want that with our partners and our spouses and our children. We want that with everybody in our life. We want people to be whole and complete around us. I love that. I, you know, I, I, man, there is so much here. Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to put the, uh, the show notes, uh, I'll put the book in the show notes uh, for, for people that want to access that. One of the things that you mentioned, I just like at the very start, you said, hey, we need to slow down. Yeah. And I was thinking about, I hear this even with professional athletes, right? I, I, I love sports and I always hear them talking about the elite players. They're able to slow the game down. Right. They're able to like, in, you know, they come from college. Now they're the pro. Everybody's great. They're you know, everybody's fast, but the elite are able to slow it down. And I was thinking, that's what I was thinking about it, thinking, OK, if you really want to be elite, the first thing you do is figure out how can I slow it down? I loved how you also talked about holding space. Here, here's the thing. I. I get asked a lot of questions and I immediately want to share yeah. <laughs> advice. So I personally, I'm thinking, okay, I need this. How can someone slow it down? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, so it's all great in theory, right? Yeah. It's really hard in practice, you know? And so it, it really, for me personally, it is, it is really just taking a pause. Sometimes it might be counting to three or maybe mm -hmm. five is your number. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, that is something that I have found to be helpful. And uh, it might be taking a breath and then answering. Um, I have found that in when we are in reactive mode, reactive advice giving, we're just, you know, it's whatever comes out of our mouth and we're, you know, there's, there's no time for a breath. But if you're pausing and you're taking a breath and you're counting for three to five seconds, that can make a big difference. Uh, so other than that, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's self-control too. I think a lot of times too, is whenever uh, you're able to give that person, you said holding space, but you're able to ask those questions. It also makes the other person probably feel like you really care, even though you're really also challenging them by asking questions, you make them feel like, like they're being heard, right? Yeah, you know, that's a really good point, Bruce, because, and again, this comes from, um, from Michael Bungay uh, Stainer's work, is that when you are giving advice to somebody, you are essentially one-upping yourself against the other person. Mm. And you are saying, I'm smarter than you, I'm better than you, I'm faster than you, I'm younger than you, I'm whatever, I'm better mm. than you. That is the hidden statement in reactive advice giving. And so there's the diminishment of that to the other person to deal with, but we don't think about those things. But that's why it's important to slow down and not be so you know, quick to give advice, slow down the need to, so it's not, again, it's not never give advice. It's just less often and less reactively. Yeah, I think that uh, it sounds to me also, that's, that's one of those skills that not only 
it can be learned, but often it also takes experience to and and vulnerability and mm -hmm. courage to ask those questions and, and go through the process, right? I mean, like tell tell me, I'm just curious about you. Like, I think you are pretty good at asking those questions and pretty skilled at this. Were you always good at that or did you, did it take some practice? Tell me about like your experience. Oh, no, it's something that I deal with all the time. It, it, it is, oh, and still it, today. Still, to, still today. And I'm, I'm practicing all of the time. I, you know, I stay curious with, with my neighbor, mm. with people I meet in the grocery store. Uh, I mean, just, it's just, I was with my nephew yesterday and he was saying some things and I was just, you know, really, it is a muscle. It's a mm. muscle. And, um, right now I'm working, I have, I'm getting recredentialed this, this year. So every three years we have to get recredentialed, which is not insignificant. And I have to have, you know, 10 hours of a mentor coach. So this is something, you know, the, the, there've been a shift in competencies that get assessed by international coaching federation that go into effect the second half of 2021. Um, and so this is the timing of all of this is good. So I have made it, um, you know, my personal, this is part of my own personal development is to stay curious just a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, you made a good point about vulnerability because when you are curious, when you stay in curiosity just a little bit longer, you're really stepping into ambiguity and that's mm. vulnerable. That's a great, great point. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is so good. As a matter of fact, it's very, I'm, I have chills right now. I mean, I'm like, I'm inspired because I, I feel like I'm a pretty curious person, but now just from this short conversation we've had so far, I want to go deeper into yeah. that. And so I loved how you should that. Hey, you talked about mentors uh, there. I, I want to, I want to just go there just for a second. I am curious. Mm -hmm. uh, have you like, did you have some mentors that have like helped you through your pro? I mean, it seems to me like leaders that like drive in that leadership lane, they have had people that are, I call it in the carpool lane. They've had people that are right there with them. Uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about some mentors that you've had in your career. Yeah. Oh, so um, I just had uh, uh, an exchange with her yesterday. Her name is Allison Kate. She's retired now. And um, so when I, when I entered the workforce, I went into the federal sector and I stayed eight years there. And I wanted to transition into the private sector. And I was really having difficulty marketing my resume. And there was a lot of stigma around the federal employee. And, and um, I remember I was working with recruiter. There was an opportunity in Allison's company. And um, he had connected with her and, and she said, oh, no, 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 no. I know that organization. Clock watcher can't think outside the box. And so he said, no, no, no. You have to meet her. She's not like that. Mm. And Allison and I met and we hit it off just mm. like that. And I went to work for her, uh, the company that she was with, it's um, privately owned, family owned business, the multimedia communications company, most famous for being the creators of Barney the Dinosaur and Wishbone. Okay. And, uh, and so I stayed for two years and then I left, I went to work uh, into Nortel after that, but I, I stayed in touch with her because what I found is that really the mentorship started after I left the company, because I don't care what anybody says, your people manager cannot be your mentor because mm. you need someone to talk about, you know, you need, to, you need to talk to somebody else about your people manager. <laughs> and so, and, and so I would call her and I'd say, okay, well, this is the issue going on because in HR, we can't go out to our, you know, colleagues, we can't go on and, and talk to about things that are happening within the business we're supporting. That would be completely inappropriate. And I would call her and say, how would you handle the situation? What do you think? You know? And so that relationship has just evolved. And I can call her not only a mentor today, 22 years later, but also a friend. And she has watched me go from being, you know, somebody who was, you talk about somebody who had struggles with being curious. 
I was a very black and white person. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and you cannot function that way in the field of HR. There's so much gray. And so I have grown and evolved um, it, it, in, in a way that she, you know, will often comment about that. Do you remember when you used to? Um, she's also given me great uh, counsel when I have had job opportunities presented to me. I've had, I've called her just to be a sounding board. I've got this job offer. I'm kind of concerned about this. You know, it's just great to have somebody who, who understands the language. But what I think is so cool about Allison is that she would have been one of probably two women in her MBA class 40 or 50 years ago, or no women. And then she entered into the HR space in compensation in the oil and gas industry, which was all male dominated. So she has been a pioneer of sorts. Yeah. Oh man. She sounds very, very special. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, I, I heard, uh, I've, I've heard this before, but I heard Steve Brown, he's uh, serves on the Sherm uh, board and he talked about, you, you know, everybody needs a few people. He said five people at the time, but everybody needs a few people outside the workplace just to talk to. And that's what you were talking about. You know, when you talked about, you can't necessarily be the people manager because you just need to talk about your people, right? You just need to have those people to talk to. I am curious, do you also mentor people today? Tell, tell me about that. Yes. yes. I, I so believe in that. You know, somebody helped me along the way. Allison helped me, other people helped me, and I'm a big believer in paying it forward. So um, number one, I became involved on the associate board at SMU through their um, uh, executive mentoring program. I've been doing that for about uh, 12 years, and that's where they match executives um, in the local business community with first year MBA uh, students. And so I, um, I've been doing that. I will take on no more than one student at a time. I really, that's, that is my comfort level. And then there's a, a young woman uh, that worked for me many years ago, and uh, you know her, and our relationship has evolved into a mentorship. I have been very um, encouraged. Uh, it's just a good feeling to see Carolyn grow in, into the place that she has, has grown into. Yeah, it just it just feels good. I, I uh, I've been involved in the Dallas HR mentor mentorship program for, for a while, and and it just feels good to be able to uh, just kind of well coach and, and guide uh, the uh, it, it through these young upcoming leaders through the process. It's just it just feels there's nothing like it. I I just absolutely love that. I love. It. Hey, I want to just real quick before we shift. Um, I want, there's another area of mentorship that I feel like you have an incredible talent for. And that is, you post a lot of things on social media, uh -huh. an incredible amount of information on leadership and development and how to get better. I just really, I'm just curious, like, what drives you to do that? You know, it just it, it, uh, it well, it's what's on my mind. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's what's on my mind. And I, I think it's relevant to what, what's ever happening currently. Uh, and I, and I like to share it with the community, uh, particularly right now, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, uh, culture, uh, we're talking about, um, you know, being curious and leadership and asking good questions. And so there are things that just speak to me around curiosity and around being a better leader. I'm just, I, I want to, I want to share it with others. And I, I really appreciate others' perspectives. I, I like when people comment on my posts. I like when they make me think it's, it's good all around. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And on the same way, I, whenever I'm posting things, most of the time I'm posting something because it's on my mind. I feel like it's going to help me. And if it's going to help me, you know what? It may help someone else. I am with you when someone engages in the post. I love that because it makes me if I feel like others are around me and it gives me different perspectives, I can say, you know what? I did not look at it that way. And it may give me a whole different view. I, I wish I, others would, could, could engage more on that. And I want to just say, I want to ask you for someone listening right now, um, what would your, I don't know, what would your advice be to someone about either posting or commenting how it might help them? Or what would your advice be to, to help them kind of get started in that? 
You know, I think it's, uh, well, first of all, commenting. So if you're, let's just say, for example, you're in job search mode. Mm. Um, it, it really is um, a, um, uh, a nice way to, to get your name out there and to comment on people's posts. If you're in job search mode and you, there's a company that you're following, and you'd really like to, you know, work for that company, you need to start following them. Uh, and you can do that on your LinkedIn and then find people who work for that company and start commenting on their posts. And so when the CEO or the CHRO is, are, are posting, you can comment on their um, uh, post because that's what they're doing, right? That's how you get attention and that's how you get more traction uh, to your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, there, there's just so much value in not not just for for you and getting that awareness, but also for the person that posted it. You don't realize how much they appreciate hearing your perspective. Uh, I've shared this story uh, uh, before on the podcast, but I remember as a young uh, leader coming into our organization, I was in my mid thirties at the time. I say that was, <laughs> and I remember there were about a dozen leaders around the table and everyone was pretty much, they were all veterans. They were all experienced many, many years. And I remember I didn't really speak up that much because I was thinking, I want to hear from them. Mm -hmm. I want to learn what they have to say. I want to be a sponge. I want to really learn. Now I'm on the other side of the table and I want to hear what the younger people have to say. And so now I look back, I think, gosh, I wish I would have spoke up a little bit more because I didn't realize they wanted to hear my voice. Mm. Yeah. So, so it's it. So when you talk about social, so my point is on social media, people want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. And some people don't. Right. And then they have choices, <laughs> uh, you know, and and, uh, and and so but I think it's really important, you know, uh, it's it, to be kind. You know, mm. you may not agree with whatever is somebody has posted but it's it, that first and foremost, it's, it's, it's just to be kind. If, you know, there's so many things that have happened in the last 15 months for the, for the world, I hope that we can continue to extend kindness to each other as we're re-entering life. Um, I hope that doesn't go out the window. I love that. Oh my gosh, this has been so good. Oh my goodness. Hey, let's talk leadership here. 2021, I know 2020 has been a heavy, heavy time. Uh, we're not out of the pandemic, but we're certainly learning how to navigate through it. And I, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of different ways whenever I talk about leadership, everyone seems to have a different definition. So what I want to ask you, Nicole, is when someone asks you, hey, what is leadership to you? What do you have to say to that? Uh, I have appropriated Brene Brown's definition of leadership, and that is anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and has the courage to develop that potential. That's leadership to me. That it is not a corner office. It's not a title. It is the willingness to step up and put yourself out there and lean into courage because, you know, we need braver leaders in this world for sure. Okay. So I absolutely love that. That's fantastic. We just finished reading Dare to Lead. Mm -hmm. And I believe I saw that in there, uh, in that book yeah. and, oh man, she's, she's so good. She's got yeah. so much great material, but I love you said, uh, and having the courage, the courage to develop that talent. Yes. Right. And, and that, cause I've always, uh, kind of went by, you know, John Maxwell always talked about leadership as influence, nothing more, nothing less, right. It's influencing, but, it's, but then once you've influenced through, you know, your vision now, now you got to, you got to do the developing piece of it along the way. And I think that's something we all need to remember, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about many years ago, I had, um, a role, I was in labor relations and I had been typed, this was the advent of succession planning. And I remember I was the, um, you know, the youngest person on the team, there, was, there were five people. It was the most coveted role to have in, in all of the HR organization for the global headquarters of this company. And, and so I remember that when we gave advice to the field, and of course there's no menu board of answers in labor relations, right? There's, it's, it's a lot of interpretation. And so we would copy each other on the, um, it, you know, whatever we were um, transmitting to the field, HR managers. And my boss was a former English teacher. And so where I'm going with this is that being a leader too is being a teacher. 
Mm. And so he was leveraging his teaching. And I remember I had given some advice to the field about something and he was copied and so was the team. And he came back to me and he said, Mr. Rocco, please tell me why you gave that, that uh, recommendation. And I said, well, ABC, you know, I was very, you know, very confident in my response. And he came back, I love your sense of ownership. I like how you think, Mr. Rocco. Your advice stinks nonetheless. <laughs> 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 and, and what was so great about that is that I had, there had been a ruling the day before from, and this is when I was in the federal sector. So it was the Federal Labor Relations Authority, not the NLRB, not the National Labor Relations Board. And they had come out with a ruling the day before and I hadn't seen it, which made the recommendation that I was giving null and void. So, so anyway, what, what was so great is that it stung a little bit, but he used humor. Oh. And what it taught me is that he was using his teaching muscle to say, you better make sure all your ducks are in a row before you go out to the world and give, give all those recommendations because the law is changing all the time. I, lo I love that because uh, just like you talked about, he, he <laughs> the advice stung, but because he gave, put some humor into it, it, it made it more like calming. I think you used yeah. that word earlier. It sounds to me, Lo, know that it sounds to me like he, he understood like the, the law of connection. He knew yeah. how to like really connect. And it seems to me like leaders that understand that that connection, the way to connect uh, are the ones that really can just like move people to just new, just move, uh, move people to new places. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, because really at the end of the day, people want to know, do you see me? Do you hear me? Does mm. what I say matter? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Hey, I, I want to ask you a question. I mean, obviously, you are very experienced, global HR executive. What? what and but when I, I remember taking the PHR back in the day, and I remember thinking, oh man, there are so many different hats that you wear, right? From business strategy, workforce planning, comp and benefit. I mean, on and on and on and on. What areas did you like? Did you enjoy, or do you enjoy most? Yeah. Uh, my sweet spot is at the table with the business as an HR business partner and thought leader on talent strategy to drive growth and innovation. Mm. That, is, that is my sweet spot uh, because I'm here to say that talent is a business challenge. It mm. is not an HR issue. And I love sharing the power of HR with others and helping them to realize the impact that it can have on the system success of a business. So talent is a business challenge. It is not an HR issue. Mm. So we can, we can um, certainly help and partner with the business to advance those organizational capabilities around talent. Um, but that's really where I get jazzed. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I do think that the HR role is continues to evolve, right? Mm -hmm. um, hey, let me, um, let me ask you for someone that's listening right now, and uh, you're probably not going to be able to ask a lot of questions <laughs> on a podcast, but how would you not necessarily coach, but like, what are some like things that you would share? Let's just say with someone listening, that's just looking to develop as an HR professional, maybe they're a manager today uh, or a director today, and they want to just continue to grow uh, to be the, you know, uh, the, the best leader that they can be. Yeah. Any like advice or things that you did to, to get better that you might be able to share? Um, well, one, I'd say first and foremost, find a mentor. Mm. Really. I mean, find a man. You can't do this. You can't do this alone. And um, and so I think that's really, really important. And find a mentor who is available and willing because lots of mentors, you know, it, it, they happen organically. And then there's those formal mentor programs that companies run where people are assigned. And sometimes those don't work out so well, you know? And so you really want to make sure that, um, you know, when I raised my hand to sit on the associate board at SMU to be on that mentoring program, I'm saying that I'm available. Uh, I'm willing to take one student at a time. You know, we, there are some mentors who take on two or three at a time. But 
but find someone who is is open and available to that. Someone that you admire, someone who um, uh, has something to offer. Mm. And oh, and by the way, they don't need to be in your same industry. Mm. Um, I will never forget the first uh, young man that I mentored uh, many years ago through the uh, SMU Executive Mentoring Program. He was just convinced he wanted to transition from advertising into the CPG environment. And he was convinced that there was no way I could help him because I was in HR. Well, let's think about this. Um, all of the issues that he had because he needed to find an internship um, were around how to market his resume, mm. how to get the interview, um, how to best position himself for making that transition. Those are all things that are in our back pocket as an mm. HR leader, right, Bruce? That's right. So, yeah. So anyway, so it's not, um, and it's just like in coaching. Sometimes people will say prospective clients, I only want to work with a coach who knows the banking industry. I only want to work with a coach who knows the airline industry. Guess what? The process is the same. The methodology that we use in coaching is the same, no matter if you're in the airline industry or if you're in, you know, if you're in the banking uh, business. Um, if it's time management is your issue, I'm going to use the same coaching methodology that I would in the other industry. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I agree 100% with everything you said there. You right, right on track. Listen, if you're listening right now, make make notes. This is really, really good stuff. Hey, I want, I want to ask you this. What what about somebody right now that they pulled over the side of the road? They're like, oh man, this is so good. I get a mentor. Uh, but where do I find a mentor, right? I know you talked about doing some mentoring at SMU. I talked about doing some mentoring at at Dallas HR, but what are some like practical, like some practical areas that uh, people can find a mentor? I, I think within, first of all, within your company, I think it's always a good idea to kind of, kind of look at, you know, in your backyard, so to speak, and who is around you? Who, who have you observed? Who, you know, who are, uh, do you admire? Um, and, you know, approach that individual and ask them for their time and if they would be open to having coffee or, or lunch or what have you. Um, I think also too, um, some, I think it serves you well to go outside your company. You know, maybe you do stay in the same industry, but you know, you go to a different company. I think that's helpful as well. Get different perspectives. Yeah, no, great tips. As a matter of fact, I've had, uh, I've had a few people that even approach me on LinkedIn. And what's been interesting about that is the people that I've found myself making time for are the people that are very uh, clear on what they want. Hey, my name's John. I just want 15 minutes. Here's what I want to talk about. Do you have time for this? And so, uh, yeah, there, uh, I, I think one of uh, uh, Annie Corolla was on the show uh, in season one, and she talked about how mentors are everywhere if you have the right mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Isn't yeah. that the truth? What about, okay, so what about for, so there's a lot of senior executives that listen to the show as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about once we get to a certain level, a lot, a lot of times, yes, we reach down to help people up. But we still need to talk to people, right? A hundred percent. Talk about, I, talk about that. What about an executive? What, what, what should they always be thinking about? Well, I think they should always be, you know, it's, first of all, you're never too old. You're never too experienced. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, you never, you know, you're just, you just, you never. I mean, I hope that I am always growing, changing, and evolving, Bruce, because if I'm not, then I'm dead, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. so, and so um, I talked about my mentor, Allison, who 22 years later, I am still in, you know, relationship with and, and in contact. And she's still, you know, um, I still have, you know, challenges in my, in my career and what should I do? I'm at a crossroads and, and she is still that. I mean, we, we have to have that as human beings. Yeah, absolutely. no, that, absolutely. It's fantastic. So make sure that you are connected to someone that you can just like talk to. I, I think that's, oh, that is so great. Hey, I want to, I want to talk about um, leading you. I mean, I know we've talked about leading a team. We've talked about, you know, mentorship. We've talked about curiosity. We've talked about a lot of different things, but I want to talk about leading Nicole. And I would love to hear uh, just about your everyday. Like, are you an early riser? And the, one of the things I'd like to pull out, if you could share is, 
are there some practices or is there a practice that you, is there something you do every day that keeps you on track as a leader? Yeah, I mean, well, there's a couple of things. I think one, um, first of all, I, I, I carry a notebook, you know, for jotting, jotting, jotting notes. I know it's not very high tech, but you know, I'm tactile. <laughs> I like, I like the, you know, the, the act of writing with a pen and paper. It helps me to remember. Um, another practice that I have that really keeps me on point is um, I have a 24 hour rule on hitting the send button on emails, especially when they're inflammatory emails mm. that have been sent to me. And that really helps to pause. We're kind of going back to our earlier conversation about how do you keep from giving reactive advice the yeah. same thing, take a pause. And so I sit on it for 24 hours. But I also, Bruce, do that in my writing because I will write a lot uh, articles for different magazines. I write on LinkedIn as an example. It is not uncommon for me to put something away for a week, particularly when I'm having a writer's block and come back to it a week later and have a, just a different perspective and new ideas. Mm. So um, that, really, um, that really helps a lot. Um, and then, you know, for me, just my best self is really, I practice extreme self-care. Mm. I'm a fan of extreme self-care. And what that looks like is I get eight hours of sleep a night. Mm. I drink a lot of water. I have a balanced diet. I work out five to six days a week through strength, weight, and endurance training. And it really centers me both physically, emotionally, spiritually, and it is pivotal to how I show up to the world at large. I love that. I love how you use the word show up. Uh, I, I'm the same way. I work out, I work out, you know, try to work out five days a week. I probably don't eat as good as I should or could, uh, but I try every day. Hey, I want to I talk about that just for a second, because I think that's really important. One of the things that I, I feels like I observed, and I don't know if it's because I've just been looking for that and I'm just seeing it everywhere, um, you know, the frequency illusion effect or what, but it seems to me like everybody's busy. We're mm. so busy, busier than ever, right? We're doing more with less. And I, I just want you to really tap on that a little bit harder about how important is it for us to take time for ourselves before we do anything else. Yeah. It's, it's paramount, it's paramount. You cannot, be, you cannot be there and present for your partner, your spouse, your children, your employer, uh, if you are not practicing self-care. Mm. And if you think about being a leader as well, if, you know, if you're burning both ends of the candle, that's what you're modeling to your team, you know, that's, that's not so good. And, and so they need to know because you're setting the tone for this is what is important. And this is about, you know, particularly as what we've come out of the last 15 months, you know, for your mental well being, you know, for your emotional well being, you know, just all of it. You're a whole person. It is, it's, it's important. And uh, because in a, if you're a parent, what you model to your children, um, is, is incredibly important because they will take that with them. Through yeah, that, yeah, no, that's, no, that's fantastic. I think it's so important. And I, I, I see this a lot and I'm like, listen, you got to get out of the office, but we're just like, we have all this work to do. And, uh, it's easy to just get caught up in our work, but we've got to find time to, uh, and that's what I find. It seems to me like people that like live life in the leadership lane, they find time for that self-care. They find time to, uh, to, to invest in their health and their wellness. And so I appreciate you sharing that. Oh, so much. And by the way, I carry a, a, a notebook as well. Everywhere oh, you do I good. go. <laughs> great, great minds think alike. Exactly. I'm like, <laughs> I have to have my notebook. Hey, I want to, I want to ask you a question before we pivot here, uh, into the last uh, segment. I want to ask you, have you ever been given any advice from a, you know, family, a friend or colleague? I mean, it was so good. You just like, you find yourself giving it to others often. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was, uh, my dad gave me a, a nugget, a pearl of wisdom. And he gave me lots of nuggets, you know, throughout the course of his life. But there was one in particular that I have never forgotten. I was entering the workforce. And he said to me, just remember, Nicole, when you get on an elevator, 
People do not talk about how much you contributed to the bottom line. They don't talk about how much you made that stock price go up. They talk about how you treated them. Mm. And if you think about that analogy, when you get on an elevator and the chit chat that goes on in an elevator, it's that Bob, he's such a nice guy or that Mary, she's kind of, you know, not so nice. They're talking about the experience of you. Mm. And the more that, the longer I'm in the workforce, the more mature that I have become, I am just uh, reminded of that all of the time. And it's just, it's, it's just, it's crucial. It is just, it's about, people don't remember how smart you were. They remember how you treated them. I love that. That is so good. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. that that's yeah. amazing. Hey, you know, as I think about that, I want to just, I want to ask you one last question before we get into the last segment, because I I thought about that and I thought, you know, that's all about employee brand. And, you know, we're talking a lot about that today, about the employee brand. And and a lot of people don't, you know, don't realize you have a brand. Like how important, I mean, to you as an executive, as you look around, when you're looking around the room, how important is it to have a good employee brand? Uh. Oh, well, it's, it's hugely important. That's, that's your, that's your value proposition. You know, Mm -hmm. that is, that is your, that is how you differentiate yourself in the marketplace. And right now we're about, I don't think companies understand what's about to hit them right now with the uptick in job openings and the market, the labor market opening up and uh, people are making choices to say, oh, you're not going to give me a choice to be able to continue to work from home or, you know, you're not going to offer me this or what, oh, I'm, I will go next door because this employer will offer that to me. So um, absolutely, it's part, your, your brand is, and what the employee experiences and what they're putting on Glassdoor and the like, what they're posting on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's very important. So right now, there's never been a better time for you, uh, anyone listening to this, uh, to continue to like shape your 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 brand as an employee and as an employer, yeah. right? To yeah. shape your culture and and how you how you treat. And, and I think curiosity. We talked about that earlier. That's one of those pieces, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. No <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Oh my gosh! I told. Listen, I told you this time was going to go by super fast. It did. It has. It has. Hey, I want to shift over to the last part of it. It's called It's Time to Accelerate. And I always like to ask uh, my guests, would you rather read a book or listen to a podcast? Um, Both. I I can't. I'm so I can't make a choice, Bruce. (laughs) I'm equal opportunity. I like them both. (laughs) I love it. Hey, let me ask you this. You talked uh, about Michael. Is it Bengay? Uh, Bungay. Yeah. Bungay. You talked about Stanger. So that would be one of those books. Uh, it sounds like that's a pretty good one that people ought to check out. Yeah. The, uh, the coaching habit and the advice trap is his second book. Perfect. I'm going to put those in the show notes so people can connect and check those out. Hey, let me ask you this. Yes. What are you, what are you grateful for? Uh, I am grateful for being here with you in this moment. Truly. I love that. Thank you. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. And I'm grateful that you came on the show. Yeah. Hey, uh, here we are, you know, middle, you know, we're, we're on the second half of 2021. Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you, I mean, we're, we're not out of the pandemic. We're navigating through, what are you like looking forward to on the other side? I'm going on my first out of state in an airplane trip at the end of August. I'm so excited. I'm giddy. Listen, I'm not going to Provence, you know, that's, that's to come. Uh, I'll be on the East Coast in the United States, but I am getting out of Dodge. I am so excited. <laughs> How exciting is that? Oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> One of the things that I always like to ask my guests, I love to know, like, what energizes you? Like, is it something personal? Is it something professional? Just what, like, what gets you going? Yeah, um, I actually have five things that energize me. Uh, the, the first I'm taking one, notes. Okay. The first one is, is it's practicing a wellness centric lifestyle. Mm. Um, the second one is expanding on personal growth. Mm. Um, the third thing that really energizes me is supporting underprivileged women. I'm really mm. committed to that. Um, creating home and art 
is the fourth thing that mm. energizes me. Mm -hmm. And the fifth thing that energizes me is thoughtful and spiritual people. Oh, man, I love that. Oh, my goodness. That is so good. I appreciate you sharing that. Hey, I want to ask you the final question. Uh -huh. And this is my favorite question. Nicole, 10 years older, she is around the corner. She is ringing your doorbell and you're going to go answer that door. Mm -hmm. What's she going to tell you? Um, this really comes from the work of the late author, Amy Krause Rosenthal. And she said, pay attention to what you pay attention to if you want to know what to do with your life. And for me, you know, I, I've thought about there have been uh, times where I have let information flow passively in my life without careful or sustained attention to what I'm paying attention to. And so it really is, if you want to know what to do with your life, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. Okay, now I'm even more curious. <laughs> this is so good. I appreciate you sharing that. That was like, yeah. I, have, I have chills. That was yeah. so good. I will definitely be, I've taken so many notes today. I'm going to be reflecting on all of this conversation. Uh, Nicole, I want to just just tell you thank you for just coming on the show today sharing your perspective around like executive coaching around thought leadership i mean just so much if someone wanted to connect with you they wanted to learn more about maybe something we shared today or they just want to follow you how is the best way for them to connect well, the best way would be on LinkedIn. That's that is so. Um, I do have uh, I do have a few followers there, and um, it, so that's the best way. So I'm always open to invitations to connect there. I uh, also uh, I have a website, NicoleDurocco.com. Um, people are, are certainly welcome to go check that out too. But I'm very active on LinkedIn. Oh, perfect. I will definitely put your website in the show notes as well, so yeah. people can click on there and and uh, connect with you that way too. Nicole Duraco, I you are definitely driving in the leadership lane. I appreciate Thank you coming you. on the show and just sharing your wisdom and perspective. And I, I just appreciate our friendship. Thank you so much for coming Thank on today. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Now I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I cannot wait to share it. I'll talk to you later. Okay.